Hi there, it's Ian here, and you're watching Grumpy Opinions, the show where I'm going to tell you all about what I think of films, TV shows, games, and life in general. Let's get on with the show. Hi there, I'm feeling a lot better this week, so let's just jump straight into things. Thank you for all your well-wishing. Outlander is the historical TV drama show from Stars TV. It's a bit clear in Jamie Fraser, a couple from different eras who are reunited after 20 years apart in different centuries. Episode 9, Doldrums, finds Jamie and Claire about to set off on a ship, set for Jamaica, to follow the Portuguese ship that kidnapped wee Ian last week. It's not entirely clear how long it took them to organise all this, but they've managed to drum up a couple of the dudes that Jamie knew from Ardsmere back in the day, and they've chartered a boat that's going to take them with all speed to catch up with it. Of course, once they're actually out at sea, we're reminded that this isn't the 20th century anymore, as you know, all the sailors here are kind of superstitious about touching a horseshoe. It turns out that both redheads and women are unlucky at sea, so both Jamie and Claire are bad news all round. But just as the happy gish couple are laughing about this, Parsley and Fungus come up from below. Turns out that she's stowed away because they've been courting a bit and they wed in secret, and so they want to kick it back in the Caribbean for like a honeymoon or something and some long put off nookie. Jamie is naturally really aghast at this, since he's, you know, kind of already in Stuki with Leary, who's Parsley's mum, and out of understandable concern that, you know, she's his adoptive daughter, as well as having Claire being pissed off. I mean, that's a major concern on his mind, because things aren't hunky-dory with them. But since the young couple maintain that they're all about each other, Jamie and Claire decide to have a little bit of a chat about it, you know, and actually see what's going on, what they can do about this, because, you know, it needs to be sorted out, and he's a little bit cross. But also, you know, his rubbish sea tummy is probably going to get the better of him, so Claire wants to make sure that doesn't happen. So anyway, while he ends up inevitably like puking up in a bucket lot, she ends up keeping herself busy, like mending injured sailors and scoffing at all their silly superstitions in a very clear way. And then she ends up having dinner with the captain who tries to explain to her that going along with like the superstitions is often the best way to keep a happy ship running, even if you know you think it's all nonsense. And she kinda just rolls her eyes at that. Then after that we get to see like wee parsley stand up to Claire since you know they have to room it, because Jamie has orders that there's gonna be no sex on the ship. And of course, it's an awfully long voyage, especially without the sex, so Claire takes the opportunity to start like dressing like that wee bent from Hellwater and chatting to Mr Willoughby, who, you know, it turns out is writing his poetry and he's writing down his life story, but he won't tell it until it's the right time when he's finished, because that means he's have to abandon it. And then, you know, when he isn't doing that, he's doing acupuncture on Jamie to get rid of Jamie's seasickness, which turns out worked better than the tea that Claire was making him. And then Claire is totally okay with all this because, you know, she's from the 1960s. And while Jamie's tummy's alright, the ship starts going off in complete all sorts because the wind's gone and the ship comes becalmed. And, you know, this goes on for weeks apparently. And then the water starts going bad and the food's probably running low as well. And everyone's really cross. And there's talk of a Jonah on board and other stuff like that. Because, yeah, we're in total hornblower territory here. And the captain starts talking about blaming someone to pacify the crew. And despite there being two women, a Frenchman and a Chinese guy on board, it's pretty clear who's going to be, simply due to the unusually high number of lines that one of the guys from Ardmir was given. Anyway, so the crew gets antsy, and the guy from Ardmir climbs up the mainsail and threatens to like, kill himself off, forcing Jamie to do a big heroic climb and talk him down from his suicide, and then having to rescue him when he slips. But then the crew's still talking about killing the guy, when Mr Willoughby notices some seagulls, so then he, he writes some more into existence or something using magic. No, I'm just kidding, you know, he writes some poetry down for some reason. Then he ends up telling everyone his life story, which has enough, like, porny talk of bosoms and balls to keep all the sailors interested, until, you know, the wind picks up enough that, with a flourish, he tosses paper out to sea, and that shows that everything's started up again, and everyone cheers up. And so with everything a wee bit more sensible, Claymie and Jer decide to have a quick rummage in a storeroom, and just after that, a navy ship appears, and Jamie has to save everyone from plot-related fever. I mean, naturally, she knows exactly what to do, because it's typhoid, and she's already been given a jag to like make her immune to that in the 20th century. So once she's aboard, she does give the wee acting captain a lot of advice and orders about what to do, and says he has to head to port as soon as possible, and she'll help arrange things and sort them out. And then she's really shocked when he immediately like you know sets sail with, with her still on the boat. I mean, dearie me, Claire. You might have thought that went through a little bit better. So what did I think? Well, I think this was a fairly fun episode all round. I mean, you know, the sea nature of it did add a help of touch of variety to the Outlander world and kind of gave the characters a chance to have a fun in a new place and, you know, new surroundings and locations. And it was a bit of a breakup of seeing, you know, the, the humdrum sort of Scottish world that we've been seeing for the last little while. It's a bit like when we went out to France in season two. Anyway, a sea voyage to the New World is also an opportunity to like lock a few characters in a, in a single place that can't make them go anywhere, and then have them confront each other with new, new and interesting ideas and personality stuff, and taking them all out of their comfort zone just a wee bit. 
And there's an awful lot of familiar stuff here as well, you know, with some great visuals and historical things. And there was some really, really nice stuff with Mr. Willoughby, who pretty much stole the show. And there's some really, really good work from him. I mean, you know, Gary Young seems to be a fantastic actor, you know, playing this mysterious Chinese fugitive from the Royal Court, Imperial Court of China, or whatever it's called. And anyway, it was great to see that, um, you know, Marsley and Fergus, or Parsley and Fungus, as I've come to call them, um, because, you know, mushrooms and parsley go really well together. You know, just a little bit of garlic, saute them gently for a wee bit. It's really great. You should try it. Anyway, Marsley, I think she, her name is supposed to be, is a great wee foil for Claire. I mean, she's got that sort of mother's sly and cutting side, but without the kind of vindictive unkindness that Leary has. Now, maybe it's Jamie's small influence in her life. I mean, he's only been married to her mum for a couple of years, but she seems like a sensible and headstrong young lass, and I'm really interested to see what that's all about. However, there were more than a few things this week that bugged me, and most of which is down to this feeling kind of awfully contrived at times, but also clearly setting up stuff that it kind of ignores, because presumably it's all going to happen later. First off, we need to talk about Claire. I mean, it starts off innocuous enough, you know, she's surprised at superstitions, but that seemed a wee bit forced, because, you know, Jamie and her have taken ships from Scotland to France and back again, which, you know, even at top speed, you know, we'd only have taken a couple of days in each direction, but that's, you know, at least three or four days on a boat that they've already spent. So unless she just literally never paid any attention to the crew or anything that happened on board, it feels like this is something that would have come up before, but instead, this is all getting spoon-fed to the audience for our benefit rather than because it actually makes sense for the characters. And it doesn't really help that, you know, all of this feeds into that grumpy clear thing that's been coming across a lot recently and seems to have become like an unintentional direction they've taken with the character, more so in the TV show than in the books. Presumably, as I've said before, because the books are all written from Claire's point of view, which means that you tend to get the inner workings of her head and things tend to make a lot more sense, where instead this just makes her seem a bit snooty and kind of dismissive of the sailors and their ways. I mean, you know, that's very sensible when you're a doctor, you know, and you've got a bit of a god complex and you're working in the 20th century and you can kind of look down on everybody else for their silliness. But Claire makes an open mockery of, like, sailing traditions while on a two-month sea voyage with a load of scurvy dogs. I mean, literally on the first day. And, like, she's only got, really... Jamie and Fergus between her and a you know, plank walking, or even worse, in the event of some kind of mutiny. And even when the captain tries to like explain to her that it's a good idea to do these things, she still acts a bit shocked and kind of eye ruly I mean, I get it, that's totally what Claire's like, but you'd think after 20 years and the decision to time travel back in time again, she'd be a bit more prepared for the world. And I don't know sometimes if I'm supposed to think that she's worldly and wise, but maybe a little short-sighted, or if she's just kind of conceited and dismissive and, and a bit thick. I mean, in the sense, not because she's academically stupid, but because she just doesn't think before she opens her mouth sometimes. And at times, the two all seem to get all mixed up. I mean, let's take her order to the end. She she tells the, you know, the acting captain of that ship, get to port as fast as possible, and I'll stay here a little while to help. And then she's really shocked that he sets sail. It's like, well, do you think he was just going to hang around while people died, just so you could get happy and get back on your voyage? He doesn't care. He's the captain of a Navy ship. The Navy are, like, the powerful ones. They're the important ones. You don't mess with them. As I said, they can literally press gang everyone on that other ship into the Navy for, like, tw- 10 years or something, probably. So, I mean, you don't want to mess with them. And the power dynamic seems to have gone clearly over her head in the same way it used to do back at Leoch in the first season, and, like, also with Randall and the Redcoats then. I mean, we're two seasons on, and 20 years later... And she's doing exactly the same things. I mean, where's the character growth here? Another aspect was that this was kind of a tropey episode. I mean, I know I said it's nice and everything to do all this ship stuff, but it's really doing the ship stuff. I mean, again, this feels like a mishmash of plots that came up on things like Hornblower, Black Sails, and um, the Master and Commander film with Russell Crowe. I mean, these are stuff that they've come up before. I mean, the whole, oh no, we've been become becammed in the water and can't go anywhere and the food's running out. Let's blame a Jonah and kill him. I mean, that's pretty much as old as the rhyme of the ancient mariner. I mean, and I'm glad that they found a novel way to solve it through Mr. Willoughby's theatrics. I mean, that that was really good. But they're supposed to have spent two to three months on the ship and they spent it talking about this thing rather than actually spending it on character relationships. Speaking of which, Jamie and Claire last week seemed like they were basically broken up and it took young Ian getting kidnapped to distract them away from having their arguments and stuff. But this week starts off with them clearly like days later and yet the conversation hasn't moved on one iota. And yet, if anything, it feels like Claire's already decided to stay. She's just being a little bit vague and paying lip service to the idea that she won't to drag it out and you know make Jamie a little bit uneasy. Also, on top of that, the fungus and parsley thing was just strange. I mean, sure, why they could elope. I mean, yeah, go for it, elope. But would you really elope under the eyes of the guy that you're both kind of adopted by? I mean, on top of that, after the initial strife, the entire plotline is just ignored. Ignored when 
Claire herself says in a voiceover that weeks have passed, and then she says later on, more weeks have passed when they're running out of food and they're sitting there stuck in the middle of the water. Now, what's been going on for all these weeks, I mean, in terms of that? Because Fergus and, and Parsley just seem to have disappeared from the story completely. And, you know, and Claire and her are supposed to have had a room together, and we only get really that one scene of them and, you know, sitting talking to each other in the room and arguing and, you know, mildly going, oh, you're a who? And then, you know, the bit of Fergus and Jamie having a wee chat, there's one scene of that, and yet after that, nothing at all. And there's weeks and weeks of supposed to have passed, and it never even came up again. These people are having to live in and around each other for days and days and days and days and days. You think this would have already been sorted. I mean, I know it's a TV show and everything, but it's felt like a dropped plot thread. I mean, dropped maybe to make more spe- space for acupuncture jokes and the Jonah storyline. I mean, a few more scenes of the lads and ladies having chats might have helped to get along. I can only presume that the reason for this was because it's being saved up for later in the series, or it's going to be an ongoing plot thing that'll come up later because somebody will do something and everyone will go, you know what, I I agree that you're allowed to do it, you know, um, Jamie will turn around and go, Fergus, you're a very good man and you get to do it, and they'll be like, oh, thank you, my lord, and it'll just be like that, or something like that. Anyway. We're out of Scotland now, clearly for the foreseeable future. So it's grand to see the scope of the world opening up. I am still really interested in what's happening. So until whatever other new worldly adventures next week comes along, I've been Ian, and these have been my grumpy opinions.